Yeah, it's very is better.
just gonna point it up on the or could we schedule it to start at a certain time instead of So we are struggling. Laptop, we are laptop, trying to it's not it. really working. So let's use the feed from the My phone. I don't know what the problem is. She's not an admin. She's not an admin. Uh, uh, I think you're not. That's admin. why. That's why. And most months is not the same. It's the same feedback I'm getting. So we have a need the original admin of the page. So how come I can I'm I'm able to post? No, no, no. you are active on your phone. You are seeing what you posted there. Yeah, I think what you but post, but not cannot see. see. So ah. it's an editor, not an. Ah. I think that uh, you are just posting. Uh, mm, yeah, just you posting. are posting as a user, like. Uh, mm. like okay, so uh, come now. Uh, yes, it is. What's uh, the I, name? I have not to share it, but we can. So right now, what's the way for it with the heat? Sorry, with the as a very website. Yes. Yeah. 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 Use it. 
But I thought it was ours, and because we're using this one to so. Thank you. 
Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Board, Air Vice Marshal, Dance Commandant of the Copenhagen International Peacekeeping Training Center, the Executive Director of the Dakar Marshall Foundation, Mr. Hamagrin, our distinguished guests joining us for various institutions. Uh, also very distinguished speaker and chairperson who will be officially and appropriately introduced soon. Get from the armed forces, the public and private sectors, the sector management and The book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastics notes, and I quote, a good name is to be chosen rather than riches, and favor is better than silver and gold, unquote. It further states that, quote, a name is better than years ago, the RIPTC and the International Foundation instituted this annual lecture and seminar now at round table in honor of the two former Secretary Generals and His Excellency the Commission, two icons of peace and security and humanity whose great names and achievements continue to be celebrated and honored by us and also by the whole world. This morning we are gathered here to discuss a subject that was deeply dear to these two great islands, and this was the subject of peace, security, and progress for all. My name is Rosemont Aite. I head the corporate affairs unit at KIPTC, and once again, it is my pleasure to be the MC for this event. Well, as is the custom in Ghana, I believe everywhere else. When you visit a place, you need to be officially welcomed by the host. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, with a round of applause, help me welcome the Commandant of KIPTC, Air Vice Marshal Air Vice Marshal Air to be here for the I didn't know you forget my name. Excellency Dr. Ivan Clark, the UN Rep for Ghana, Executive Director of the Dakamashoi Foundation, Mr. Henry Kamakwe, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the KIPTC Governing Board, the Chief of Defense Staff, Ms. Rep. Generals and senior officers of the military presence, distinguished guests from the public and private sectors, the executive management team and staff of Kofiana International Peace Training Center, representatives of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We are all aware that a few weeks back, precisely about three weeks, we lost His Excellency Kofi Annan, a noble diplomat. And uh, this center bears his name. So I will humbly request that we observe a many silence by standing for just a few minutes. May his soul and the souls of 
all the people that continue to rest in peace. Thank you. May you be seated. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have you to join us for the sixth edition of the Kofi Annan Dakar Marshall Annual Lecture. The Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center and the Dakar Marshall Foundation, based in Sweden, instituted this annual event in honor of two former Secretary Generals of the United Nations to perpetuate their lasting legacies of peace, equality, and development as embodied in our shared institutional visions for a more peaceful and secure world for us all. Since the inaugural event in 2013, we have been privileged to have distinguished personalities and experts such as His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambers, Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General of West Africa and the Sahel, speaking on the topic of the continuing challenges of peace and security in Africa, a West African perspective. Again, we have Ms. Karen Langley, non-resident fellow at the Center on International Cooperation, a former special representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Liberia and head of mission in Liberia, speaking on the future of peace and security in Africa, implementation and impact of recent reviews of the United Nations peace operations. And just last year, we had Professor Isaac Olawili Albert, a professor of peace and conflict studies at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, sharing some great perspective and reflections on regional engagement in peace building in Africa, perspectives and challenges. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, lots of lives and properties. Displacement, increased levels of poverty, sexual exploitation and gender-based violence, spillovers into nearby states are some of the negative effects of armed conflicts which retrogress individuals and communities. In spite of its natural resource endowments, a very youthful population, the African continent is still described as poor in the midst of plenty. And its influence in international politics has profoundly diminished due to deficits of peace, governance, and development. Instead of making positive peace a stable prerequisite in our political governance, instability as a result of poverty, inequality, conflicts, just to mention a few, have conspired to undermine most of our governance processes. We cannot continue with this same narrative. We need to reverse this trend. We need to offer our people better life opportunities so that they can feel safe to be part of the change we so desire. The journey to reverse the trend, I believe, is by tackling the root causes of conflict and precursors to instability by prioritizing, financing, and investing in safe. I would like to commend the effort of the United Nations in fostering the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is aimed at deepening the drive to attain the twin aim of freedom from fear and freedom from want. Similarly, I commend the determination of the African Union in adopting Agenda 2063, which further seeks to silence the guns in the continent by the year 2020. The ECOWAS Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance, as well as the Conflict Prevention Framework, 
All have intentions to create conducive conditions for human security and political stability on the African continent. Today, even though we have less members of peacekeeping in Africa, the deployments in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Mali, South Sudan, and Darfur suggest that the peace and stability we have in Africa is still fragile, and our populations are still far from being safe from instability. Indeed, to achieve the sustainable development goals and to truly fulfill the call to leave no one behind, conflict prevention then becomes a precondition. The AU's Agenda 2063 and the United Nations ongoing reflective approach to peace and security efforts all point the mechanisms of prevention and partnerships to address the root causes of conflicts. It is in the support of this continental and global agenda to prevent violence and armed conflicts and to promote a better life for all that the Ophiana International Peacekeeping Training Center and the Dakar Foundation are holding this lecture on the theme Preventing Armed Conflicts, Identifying and Mitigating Risks. This theme is a natural fit into both our ambitions to be the leading and preferred international center for training, education, and research in peace and security. We strive to incorporate the needs of the SDGs, Agenda 2063, the ECPF, and the governance and democracy principles into our training, research, and academic programming to build the needed capacity and to influence policy to foster peace and stability in Africa and the world at large. Excellencies, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today we are blessed to have a distinguished speaker who will no doubt deliver a riveting lecture that will dissect the topic at hand and highlight the realities, approaches, mechanisms, and methods, as well as challenges, experiences, and many more. I would like to thank you all for honoring our invitation and for choosing to be part of this lecture. Please do participate fully and actively in this event through your questions, comments, and general thoughts during the discussion session that will follow after the lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, let me hereby once again welcome you to this center. Thank you. Thank you very much, all my friends. Ladies and gentlemen, we are streaming this event live on our website and on our Facebook pages. Uh, the website is www.kibtc.org and the Facebook address is at kibtcgh. It is now my pleasure to invite the Executive Director of the Dakamacho Foundation, Mr. Henry Kamakrin, so give us his remarks as well. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Commandant, there was much evidence, and may I also recognize the uh, lecture uh, again. UN Secretary General, Special Advisor for the International Genocide. Yeah. Your Excellency, the resident coordinator of the CNN's blog. I would also like to actually especially recognize Mohamed and Chambas who held the lecture here in 2015. All uh, Your Excellencies and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I hope by this I have sort of respected and observed all the protocol. It is indeed an honor for me to represent the Dog and Crow Foundation at uh, this sixth lecture. We are very grateful for our partnership with the Science Center. The work of our two institutions.
institutions reflect our deeply shared values and uh, principles and our mutual aim in strengthening multilateral approaches and capacities to sustain peace and strengthening the work made by the United Nations. This year's lecture is for one very obvious reason, not like the previous five. It is the first time that we hold this lecture in memory of both the Secretary Generals. We at the Dog Hunter Foundation, we were deeply saddened by the message of Kofi Annan's unexpected death. It is a great loss for the international community and for all of us working for multilateralism and peace. We will miss Kofi Annan's exceptional voice, that deep voice, that deep and very sincere voice that cuts through all the political noise in search for and call for peace, justice, and dignity. Kofi Annan's legacy is unique, it's massive, and it's far reaching. And we are particularly thankful for his 2005 reforms that actually brought about the United Nations peace building architecture. We also should reflect over the fact that all the changes that was brought about this report in larger freedom towards development, security, and human rights for all. This led to important changes across the whole system of the United Nations. As the world now focuses on the sustainable development goals, and countries commit themselves to this important new global platform, we should also recognize the background and Mr. Nunn's constant and, and, and deep leadership at the turn of the century. His milestone reports, we, the people, the role of the United Nations in the 21st century for the Millennium Summit created this fundamental development shift. The, development, the, the Millennium Development Goals and the now Sustainable Development Goals will live on as a testament to Kofi Annan's foresight. Our foundation organizes a similar Dog Hamakov lecture in Uppsala every year. And we have done so for almost 20 years. This year it was delivered by Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and he is the third Secretary General to have delivered this speech. In 2001, we were honored to have Kofi Annan delivering the lecture. And in this lecture, he called not to stray away from Gog Hamakot's, in his words, fundamental conviction that the essential task of the United Nations is to protect the weak against the strong. In the long term, the vitality and viability of the organization depend on this ability to perform this task. By adopting itself to changing realities, that, I believe, said Anna, is the biggest test it faces in the new century. With these words in mind, we should reflect on the achievements of Kofi Annan and the staff of the United Nations also when they received the Nobel Peace Prize. And that's actually another connection between Kofi Annan and Bokhama. They are the only two Secretary Generals that have been awarded this distinction. We were privileged also to have Kofi Annan present in many occasions, such as uh, his honorary doctor from Uppsala University in 2007. But I would actually like to, instead of going through a description of what we do, share with you just a short sort of um, descriptive story from one of the many visits by Kofi Annan to Sweden. Um, when he visited Dog Hammarkot's farmhouse, it's a small country farmhouse in the south of Sweden, to commemorate his 100th birthday. He, uh, we walked through this house, and Hammarkot was a very moderate man, a minimalist in many ways. But he was also a collector of art, and in his collector, uh, collection he had a few very rare but very distinct African pieces of art. Kofi Annan silently walked through this small house and all by a sudden he saw a chair and he fell on his knees in silence for a long, for a long uh, moment. And then he stood up and he explained, greatly humble, that that chair was the chair of a king, 
I came from Ghana, and he certainly had not expected to find that chair in Hamakar's house. He later learned how that chair was given to him personally, but he often referred to this moment as a moment of connection. Well, Bob Hamakar's vision for the UN was an organization for the common good of mankind, for peace, justice, human rights, and democratic principles. He acted firmly in defense of the human culture and safeguarding the interests for the new and smaller member states, particularly the African states. In doing so, Hamaka became one of the architects of the United Nations as we know it today. And he also was the person who introduced the first peacekeeping forces. Kofi Annan often referred to Hamaka during his terms in office, and he used Hamaka as a source of inspiration and in his continued effort to further develop the UN. And one example of this was the introduction to establish the People Commission and the, the uh, Peace Government Architecture. Let me now turn to this event. The purpose of this annual event can be described, be described as being people. First, it is to recognize achievements and challenges in relation to peace building at national, regional, and also international. But it's also to identify and use experience to influence policy makers on peace and security of the matters. And then thirdly, it's of course also to honor the two secretary generals. The lecture has, as was, as was uh, introduced by, by the commandant, has been delivered by a person who personified the commitment to the UN Charter. Ellen Bay, Stefan Misura, Chambas. Or in London and so on. The topics of the lectures also reflect the developments in relation to peace and security and various aspects of implementation. Today, peace building, once established under Bob Brown's leadership, has been further developed by two twin resolutions on sustaining peace that was unanimously adopted by the Security Council at the General Assembly in 2015. The, res the, the resolutions define sustaining peace as a goal and a process which encompasses activities aimed at preventing the outbreak, the escalation, continuation, and reoccurrence of armed conflict. The resolutions also emphasize that sustaining peace must be viewed as an ongoing process and that prevention must be at the very core of that work. It underlines the necessity to have an inclusive peace process including the engagement of women, youth. And it calls for a continued implementation of Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, and importantly also recognizes the newer 2015 Resolution 2250 on youth, peace and security. <coughs> the resolution also plays a new focus on the importance of partnership, not at least the role of regional organizations in sustaining peace and the need for cooperation with regional actors. So the Sustainable Peace Resolutions now constitute the most ambitious and comprehensive mandate on peace building to date, and we must ensure and engage in their implementation. Well, that said, we know that resolutions often, so it, it is and can remain, there is a risk that they will remain only words on paper. Words that we have often heard and that we know from before. And it's not until we see real change on the ground that we know that the resolution has a real value. And this lecture and this seminar that will follow is one, of, uh, one way of connecting these efforts. In addressing implementation, we must, unfortunately, also recognize the changing reality. We face negative trends in relation to the number of armed conflicts. We face also new threats to internationalism and new dimensions of security threats, so, such as, well, perhaps mainly, climate instigated security risks. Armed conflicts in this more increasingly sort of uh, internationalized the proxy engagements, external military intervention and cross-border uh, cross activities. There's a growth in radical movements and continued prol proliferation of non-state actors in armed conflicts. And this grows the whole complexity of the relationship between armed violence and uh, armed conflicts. At the time when we know that all these development challenges cannot be solved at national level, but that, that it actually requires global action, we face a paradox. 
Increasingly, we see this internationalism, uh, multilateralism, and international institutions and agreements challenged by protectionism, increased populism, and nationalism. The multilateral system in general, and the UN in particular, is actually facing daunting risks with regards to defend and uphold international norms and values. Some of the failures that we have seen also could have been prevented in action by the international community in failing protection and support for the people of many of the war-affected countries such as Yemen, Syria, the Central African Republic, Burma, Myanmar, and South Sudan, just to name a few. This calls for greater action and greater focus on prevention. And therefore, we are particularly honored to have Adam Adyeng, Secretary General, Special Advisor for Prevention of Genocide, as this year's lecture. He brings years and years of knowledge and experience from the field of international law, international criminal justice, rule of law, human rights, and democracy. Previously, this lecture was followed by a seminar. This year, we will organize a roundtable focusing on regional engagement and conflict. We will also, in the previous year, publish a report, one report focusing on the lecture and one on the outcome of the roundtable. It's our hope that this occasion of this lecture not only underscores the legacy of these two great men, these two great statesmen, but also opens additional space for the inclusivity of civil society in the work of peace and security. Kofi Annan will uh, remain a guidepost, an elder, to the work of the Dog Hunter Foundation. We remain deeply inspired by his life, his leadership, and his legacy. Thank you very much, Paul and Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, we would like to introduce the chairperson for the lecture today, and um, who is a very distinguished personality. And to disclose who the identity of this chairperson is, I would like to call on Ms. Amma Akisemi, who is the head of legal at KIPTC, to do that for us. Please let's welcome her warmly. Your Excellency, members of the diplomatic corps, senior officers of the government forces and other security agencies here present, the commandant of the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, the executive director of the Kofi Annan Commercial Foundation, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the chairperson for this event, but before I do so, I must say that I am under very, very strict instructions to keep it short, simple, and brief. That is the military style. And um, this makes it a challenge for me because brevity is usually not part of our legal training, but I will try and sum it up in these few words. Our chairperson for today's event is no stranger to the KAIPTC. She is a member of our governing board, a mother of two twin sons I just found out, and a strong advocate for gender equality and women's issues. She was appointed in January 2015 by the then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon as the UN Resident Coordinator for the Republic of Ghana. As the UN coordinator, she provides leadership within the UN country team in Ghana, which comprises of 24 UN agencies. The team works with government and other stakeholders to promote sustainable development, peace, human rights, and humanitarian capabilities. Prior to this appointment, 
She served with the U.S. International Labour Organization for 19 years. From 2006 to 2014, she was the director of the Skills and Employability Department in Geneva, working with member states to bridge the world of education to the world of work. She was assigned to Bangkok as the director of the ILO sub-regional office for East Asia from 2003 to 2006. Prior to working in East Asia, she was director of the ILO's InfoCos program on boosting employment through small enterprise development. Earlier in her career, she worked as a labor market economist with the ILO. She also worked with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization as an assistant industrial development officer. And she's also worked with the World Health Organization as a technical officer on environmental health. She is from the United States of America, but she has literally lived on all five continents of our world. She holds an MA in International Affairs from Columbia University a PhD in Labor Economics from Boston University. She speaks English, Spanish, and hopefully by the time she leaves the show of Ghana, she will be speaking Ghana and Cree. Mm -hmm. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, please help me welcome Her Excellency Christine Evans Walker. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. Commandant Brenda Evans, Air Vice Marshal, and Commandant of the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, thank you for your warm welcome this morning and for setting the scene and the seriousness of our discussion this morning. Executive Director of the Dark Commercial Foundation, Mr. Heinrich Hammergrind, thank you for your thoughtful reminder about Kofi Annan and the contributions he made to peacekeeping and the links that he always made between peacekeeping and development. And Special Advisor to U.S. Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide, Mr. Adam Dieng, welcome to Ghana again. Representatives of the diplomatic community and of the armed forces, to the management and staff of the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center, members of the media. I would like to start by thanking the Dodd Commercial Foundation and the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center for organizing this annual lecture and high-level roundtable. It's an honor to join you this morning and to serve as your chair. I appreciate very much the work of the Dodd Commercial Foundation, which has strived ever since the untimely death of the former Secretary General to carry on his work to promote peace on the basis of justice. I think that the foundation is a constant reminder of the original values that propelled the United Nations into being and a constant reminder that our work is not yet complete. And it is of course most fitting that this annual lecture be hosted by KIRPTC, which undertakes research on new and persistent causes of conflict and violence and integrates those findings into training for peacekeepers in preventing violence, in protecting the most vulnerable, and in creating safe space for rebuilding societies in the aftermath of violence. Peace, human rights, access to justice, and the rule of law are central to the global goals, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and also to the regional goals, the Agenda 2063. Peace and security are essential in their own right, but they also form the foundation for our progress towards meeting economic, social, and environmental goals. The organizers have set out an ambitious agenda for today about assessing the causes of potential conflict and about planning and implementing proactive preventive strategies. This roundtable rightly puts cooperation and coordination among regional and national actors at the heart of that effort, from the United Nations, 
African Union, ECOWAS, national governments, civil society organizations, they each have important roles to bring to bear and lessons from experience to share in identifying and mitigating risks. And I particularly appreciate the participation today of Dr. Chambas in bringing the experience of the work of the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel into this discussion. To put our collective work in perspective this morning, I want to share with you some of the remarks that UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres made at the reflame ceremony in New York on the 18th of September to commemorate the 57th anniversary of Dr. Schultz's untimely death. He said at that time, despite the passages of decades, his light of idealism, integrity, and action continues to illuminate our hearts and indeed the very soul of the United Nations. Dr. Hammarskjöld reminded us many decades ago that we are one world. We have no right to destroy it. We have no right to allow divides to fester and cause so much suffering. We have the obligation to forge solutions and to also find the truth. And the Secretary General went on to quote Dr. Hammarskjöld when he said that future generations may come to say of us that we never achieved what we set out to do. May they never be entitled to say that we failed because we lacked faith or permitted narrow self-interest to distort, distort our efforts. So today here we have the opportunity to examine root causes of persistent conflicts, to identify new risks, and to just discuss candidly what we have tried so far and what new approaches are needed to prevent conflicts and avert violence. We have an opportunity to show our commitment to work collectively beyond narrow self-interests. And here to help us in that task is someone who has worked at restoring justice in some of the aftermaths of the worst kind of rule of law and respect for human rights everywhere. It is my honor this morning to introduce our guest lecturer, Mr. Adama Dien. Mr. Dien has served as Under Secretary General and Special Advisor of the Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide for the past six years. And for a decade before that, he served as Assistant Secretary General and Registrar of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Senegalese in nationality and a jurist by training, he has brought his professional expertise to the work of the UN in Haiti and Malawi, and to the work of the International Institute of Human Rights, the Governing Council of the African Center for Democracy and Human Rights Studies, the Advisory Council of International Service for Human Rights, the Advisory Council of International Human Rights Law. So you see my pattern here. Promoting human rights, strengthening the legal institutions set up to uphold them, and fighting against impunity for those who have grossly violated human rights has been his life's work. We are very thankful for his service and grateful that he joins us today to share with us some lessons and some ideas that can strengthen our ability to prevent armed conflicts by identifying and mitigating risks. So Special Advisor Jin, Yin Denyu, Akwaba, and we thank you for your lecture. Merci beaucoup, uh, ma chère collègue Christy. Merci à mon ami Chambaz. Ben, je crois que vous tous vous comprendrez ce que je vais dire et parce que je vais parler en français. <laughs> I'm simply delighted to be joining you this morning and uh, I should say all protocol of sir uh, but still allow me to recognize 
don't know how many Shambhat. Why? Because Shambhat is for me someone who has already demonstrated that where there is a political will, where there is courage, one can achieve something. At a time when the world was witnessing what was happening in the Gambia, I did follow the back and forth of Shambhat between Dhaka, Bandhu, Konaki, and thanks to me, today we are witnessing a rebirth of democracy in the Gambia. Thanks to my appreciation to the Dhaka Foundation and the Kuti Anan International Peacekeeping Center for organizing this round table and their teams who have worked tirelessly to ensure that our state in Accra is well taken care of and our discussion is conducted in a, such a better setting. I'm equally grateful to both Henry and Christine for their introductory remarks, which has set the tone and pace for this discussion. I'm sure that by the time we leave this place, we will have so much uh, from various contributions of the distinguished, <coughs> distinguished people around in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, before I start my remarks, allow me to join colleagues and friends in Ghana and elsewhere uh, to pay my utmost tribute to the Ghana son of Africa and the world statesman, because they are now uh, who passed on a few weeks back. To most people, both in the UN and outside, the Kofi Ambadai, the very best of humanity. He represented excellence and values that continue to inspire and underpin our collective desire for a better and just world. As noted by his successor in office, Antonio Guterres, in many ways, the Kofi Annan was the United Nations. I was one of the few privileged individuals to have worked closely with Kofi. I remember the idea of the 1994 Rwanda genocide. Kofi asked me to travel to Arusha, Tanzania, and become a registrar of the ICTR, a tribunal set by the Security Council with the full support of Kofi to hold to account those responsible for these tasks. A Kofi remained the steadfast champion of justice and accountability during and after his term of office. His support to the establishment of the Act of Tribunals, International Criminal Code, and other forms of accountability mechanisms will always be remembered as a symbol of his commitment to the apply to the victims of injustice and oppression in the world. Coffee always believed and worked to uphold the UN Charter. He believed in its enormous potential to help the world achieve lasting peace. He stood up for global peace, representation for disadvantage and minority voices, rule of law, tolerance, and friendship among nations. His commitment to various initiatives to uplift humanity from abject poverty through sustainable development was unparalleled. He was the voice for the voiceless and the hope for the hopeless. Indeed, as the himself once noted, it is not realistic to think that some people can go on deriving great benefits from globalization while billions of their fellow human beings are left in abject poverty. We have to give at least a chance to share in our prosperity to our fellow citizens, and not only in its nation, but in the global community. This was the belief of Kofi, and that's the belief he devoted his life to. While accepting Nobel Peace Prize in 2001, Kofi noted, Beneath the surface of states and nations, ideas and language, lies the fate of individual human beings in need. 
answering their needs will be the mission of the new work in the century to come. Like Dr. Marshall, who we were just reminded, was saying that you have one goal. Coffee also demonstrated to us that you are one humanity. And therefore, we can see that both sectors are Coffee and Dr. Marshall are when you. I don't think that the world will ever have had such a powerful, such a committed sector pillar. And it was no surprise that uh, Antonio Guterres would say that coffee was the United Nation. And uh, humanity owes both of them a huge debt of gratitude. And we can modestly uh, repay this debt by carrying forward their vision and by embracing their values, those values they stood for and tirelessly championed. And I believe by doing this, we will not only be paying tribute uh, to these two great statesmen, but also that will be a recognition of our collective desire and indeed an obligation for our fellow citizens uh, to build a better world a based on justice, peace, and prosperity for all. Ladies and gentlemen, as we were reminded by Christine, my remarks will focus on prevention and mitigation of conflicts, whereas my mandate specifically focuses on the prevention of genocide and other atrocity crimes. In practice, a prevention focuses on mitigating risk factors that can trigger violent conflict or attacks against civilian population. Therefore, an effective prevention of atrocity crimes uh, would naturally entail both early detection and mitigation of factors that would lead uh, to armed conflict. Prevention of conflict and pro protection of populations from atrocity crimes remain a primary responsibility of states. Indeed, in the World Summit Outcome Document in 2005, the United Nations Member States reaffirmed their responsibility to protect populations from genocide experiencing world crimes and crimes against humanity, as well as their incitement. They committed to assist each other to fulfill this responsibility and to act collectively when states manifestly failed to protect its population from these crimes. This was the first such international commitment to protect population from atrocity crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, early warning is a critical component in conflict prevention and mitigation. Violent conflicts which result into atrocity crimes do not just happen overnight. These are, there are always early signs of conflicts. When the warning signs are detected, it is possible to take early preventative measures at national, regional, and international levels. To this end, my office has developed a framework of analysis based on international standards and practice that identifies risk factors for atrocity crimes that could assist to prevent conflict situation before they deteriorate. The framework has helped the office to raise risk of atrocity crimes at an early stage in many situations. Uh, for example, I was among the first UN officials uh, to issue an alert on the risk of adversity crimes in the Central African Republic, CAR, in Myanmar and South Sudan. In Yemen, along with all UN officials, I voiced warnings about the dangers facing the civilian population at several stages. Yet, these warnings were largely unheeded. Uh, to offer meaningful protection of vulnerable populations, including uh, civilian targeted by extreme violence. 
that to its credit, the African Union and the Constitutive Act has one of the most developed early warning mechanisms with a requisite legal framework for prevention. And the uh, Act obligates any member state to intervene in situations uh, to prevent genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. This legal framework, if put into practice, goes way ahead of the United Nations uh, to prevent armed conflict. ECOWAS is one of the most successful sub regional organizations uh, that has demonstrated to some extent the essence of time and decisive response uh, to the risk of armed conflict. Uh, for example, with its intervention in Cote d'Ivoire 2003 and 2011, Liberia. 1990, 1997, and 2003, Mali, 2013, and most recently, the case I had earlier in the Gambia, 2017. Early warning can be successful only if it is linked to early action. Regrettably, despite our efforts, there are still many obstacles to successful preventive early action. If we are serious about prevention, we must be prepared to act early when we see the first signs of concern. In all my interaction with member states and other stakeholders, I emphasize the importance of prevention over response. Prevention is so much less costly in all sense, but particularly in terms of human life. And it provides so many more options for action. Once we are in the crisis response mode, many doors to action are closed and the damage done can be irreversible or take decades to resolve. Although member states have repeatedly emphasized their support for prevention, this has not been sufficiently translated into concrete actions and support for preventive strategies, even when there have been credible assessments of imminent threats to populations. Many states use the principle of sovereignty to resist external assistance to their affected populations. And I strongly argue that sovereignty should not override protection, rather it should recognize sanctity of human life. If leaders are serious on preventing violent conflict, they must be open to seek assistance to protect their population in the framework of the summit outcome document, which I referred earlier. After all, this was a commitment undertaken by the world leaders of themselves. Failure or unwillingness to seek such assistance may imply that the state is either implicitly or explicitly responsible for the violence. And that is why I always caution leaders around the world that if they don't take demonstrable action to prevent atrocities against their own citizens, then, under the principle of common responsibility, they could be held accountable. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot undertake meaningful prevention without respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms universally recognized and guaranteed by the international view of rights and other international and regional instruments. In recent years, we have seen some states pushing back against the international framework of international human rights and humanitarian law that has been painstakingly and collectively developed since the end of World War II. And this poses a dangerous threat to the effectiveness of international and regional human rights systems. We have seen the direct impact of this pushback, both in country situation and in countries where 
are not only experiencing democratic and trust deficit from their citizens, but also directly targeting them in the pretext of national security. Some argue that human rights are relative and determined by culture and the political realities of each society, but this argument is flawed. It is definitely flawed if cultural traditions or religious beliefs alone were to govern a state compliance with human rights standards, then widespread disregard for and violations of human rights standards will definitely be given legitimacy. The quest for peace and a life lived with dignity and basic human rights is not limited to a particular group of societies or nations, color, gender, sexual orientation, or religious belief. It is a quest that underpin our collective humanity and enduring trust in the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If we are to achieve sustainable peace, we must reaffirm our commitment to the primacy of human dignity and human rights as reflected in the United Nations Charter and other human rights instruments. And as underscored by the preamble of the Universal Declaration, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace. It is our fundamental duty that we continue to solemnly honor and apply these words, but also use the very words as standards to hold accountable those who violate them, irrespective of who they are. Ladies and gentlemen, credible state institutions and governments that uh, citizens can trust are essential to build a peaceful society. It is always disheartening to see some governments around the world neglect their primary duty to fulfill this role and instead officials engage in misappropriation of state resources for personal gain, thus denying delivery of essential services like education, health care and security to their people. Without commitment to provide these essential services to those who lack them, our hope for the world where human life is respected and full of love, order will remain inclusive. Equally true is that developing strong rule of law institutions must also be central to our preventative efforts. Responsive rule of law institutions are key to stability, prevention, and peaceful coexistence. In post conflict situations and divided societies, the rule of law is especially critical to ensuring accountability and rebuilding trust and confidence in state institutions and government frameworks. And the breakdown of the rule of law significantly increases the risk of gross violations of human rights, which may lead to atrocity crimes. Many examples abound in Libya, Syria, Somalia, Iraq, and elsewhere. Rule of law calls for accountability for adversity crimes and other violations of human rights. And I have always argued that peace and justice are like identical twins joined at the hip. It is difficult to separate them and achieve sustainable peace in post-country situation or in the in any other society. A credible peace process is one that pays attention to the whole spectrum of justice and reconciliation. Those who have committed 
serious crimes of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity must be held to account. Amnesty should not be a scapegoat uh, to condone impunity for such serious crimes. But this criminal accountability must also be accompanied with truth seeking, which is very important to the case. It is only when truth has been established that actual healing can take place and the victims given a chance to forgive or see reparation. When truth and healing is in place, then we can embark on a credible reconciliation process. Why do we expect domestic judicial institutions to effectively complement the work of international and regional justice institutions? The reality on the ground in many countries demonstrate that local judicial systems are inadequate to sufficiently respond to the demand for justice that they are supposed to satisfy. We see justice systems that have been starving of appropriate training and financial resources, justice systems whose officers have been bribed, harassed, intimidated, or sometimes even killed, justice systems that have been the factor a strip of their very raison d'etre. It is this varied and complex challenge uh, facing judicial institutions in most countries that have partly contributed uh, to elusive peace, justice, and reconciliation in many post country situations. When serious violations are taking place, there should be no room for complacency. Why it seems to be understood today, action is still wanting. Ladies and gentlemen, while I have laid emphasis on the importance of states taking their commitment seriously as true participants in making and implementing international law and obligations, I would like to remind all of us here that this obligation should equally extend to nurturing and supporting institutions related uh, to further peace, justice, and human rights. It is only uh, through empowering these institutions, submitting to their jurisdiction, respecting and carrying out their decisions, that they can meaningfully and broadly uh, contribute to the prevention agenda and founding ideals of peace, justice, and equality to all of us. In many countries I have visited throughout the world, one of the most common explanations given by those who have taken up arms against their respective government is exclusion and marginalization. The perception of or actual exclusion of certain communities or groups of people is a key driver to armed conflicts. It is important that governments distribute resources and provide social and economic opportunities to ensure equitable participation of all citizens in the development agenda. Equally true is that development partners have responsibility to ensure that recipient governments implement development projects without favoritism or bias to certain communities. This is part of core prevention strategy, especially in divided societies. And in this regard, I'm extremely concerned with the exclusion of pastoralist communities in many parts of the world, especially in Africa, which has led to loss of many lives. Today, more people are killed in farming, herders, conflicts in Africa than terrorist attacks. In some cases, the conflict has mutated to identity and whole communities are targeted on the basis of their ethnicity or religion. 
to prevent these tragic conflicts, governments improve pastoralism in their respective national development agenda, respect their livelihoods, and guarantee them safety and security. No single community should be excluded based on its identity or for any political or economic reasons, because such ex exclusionary practices breed our conflicts. The presence of strong representative civil society is also an important motivating factor. One cannot emphasize enough the important role that civil society can play in preventing atrocity crimes. They can do so through monitoring and reporting on local developments, advocating for action to protect populations, and crucially, holding national governments and international community to account for their actions, both and omissions. Religious leaders have a special responsibility. In countries such as the Central African influence over a large number of people, these actors can choose to play either a negative or a positive role. They can either inflame religious hatred or they can foster a culture of peace and acceptance. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that an assessment of historical cases shows that adversity crimes are most likely to occur in situations of armed conflict. But genocide and crimes against humanity have also occurred outside of conflict situations. This fact underlines the importance of paying attention to understanding and reacting to the early warning signs of adversity crimes. However, we must move beyond early warning alone and insist on early action. Acting early not only increases the likelihood of being able to address the risk factor before it becomes a crisis, but I should say that uh, it should also be seen as being more cost effective than responding once the crisis is ongoing. And I think it is important, therefore, that we commit uh, to uh, gather courage uh, to put mechanisms of prevention in place. And I think Syria, Yemen, Syria are the unfortunate examples of what happened when we pretend that our problems can go away by burying our heads in the sand. And must submit also uh, that for prevention of armed conflict to be achieved, we need to do more individually and collectively. It would mean that our governments, regional and international organizations build a resilient and cohesive society. And when we see these signs of fragility, we should take early preventive action. We should be open to mediation, dialogue, and technical assistance in areas that could trigger conflicts, for example, in electoral processes or constitution making. In unfortunate conflict cases in which international crimes are committed, we must pay full spectrum of ensuring justice for victims. This means no impunity to adversity crimes. This means no politicization of the International Criminal Court, ICC, and any judicial institutions. The United Nations Security Council should seize its selectivity in the referral and interventions. Finally, we should all be protected under international norms. Our rights are inseparable and indivisible. In this context, 
I call for universal ratification of relevant convention, for example, the Genocide Convention, the Rome Statute of the ICC, and the Malabo Protocol, establishing the criminal jurisdiction of the Act of Human Rights and Justice. We must implement collective decisions we undertake at multilateral institutions to prevent conflicts and protect populations. In this year, we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also the 70th anniversary of the first international human rights treaty, the Genocide Convention. And it is very unfortunate, and I feel so sad, that uh, the Genocide Convention adopted on 9 December 1948 is yet to be ratified by about 49 states. And unfortunately, 20 of those states are from Africa, 7 from Latin America, and 18 from Asia. And as an African, the continent has witnessed the first genocide of the 20th century in the early 90s in the Namibia, the genocide committee by the German against the terror of crime. Africa, which has witnessed the genocide of the Tutsis in 1994 in Rwanda. And more so, I could have even said, Africa, which has witnessed what some refer like the late curator of the House of Slaves in Rwanda, the first genocide in court, where millions and millions and millions of our brothers and sisters taken from this land to the Americas, perished in the sea, died in worse condition. That was the first ever thanks against my TV community. With this, I would like simply to conclude the descendant to my five brothers and sisters with a prayer. May justice be our mighty defender and for all of us a key one another with dignity and respect because we are all equal in humanity. Thank <laughs> you. 
Despite the fact that preventive action is less costly in terms of human and financial resources, it keeps options open for resolving conflicts. So what are some of the constraints? You mentioned the fact that some governments are not willing to accept mediation or assistance even though they have signed agreements with other member states to do that. Constraint is a, is a lack of respect for human rights fundamental freedoms, as articulated in the commitments many governments have signed, or a lack of respect for the inherent human dignity. He also spoke about the constraint of where there are not credible state institutions to deliver essential services, including elections, uh, that they are not held accountable. He talked about Exclusion and marginalization as another source of, of constraint for taking early action, even when we know that that can result in people taking up armed conflict. 
He spoke in particular about the threat in this part of the world, uh, nomadic pastoralist communities and conflicts in rural areas. So, what are your responses? Do we agree that those are some of the main constraints to taking early preventive action? In your experience, how do we overcome those and other constraints? I think we have some broken lights. So we have time to take a few interventions and receive some responses this morning. So please, the floor is open. Do we have a microphone? Is that the second row? I think it's time to introduce yourself so that everybody can see it. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Emmanuel. Senior Division Advisor. Thank you, Excellency Admiral Jen, for uplifting and spreading this question by bringing it to the positive story of Adam and the rule of our own uh, Elder Adam. His Excellency Mohammed bin Chambers. And I say this because in the work that we do, it's very easy to hammer. Where there is desperate and hopelessness, rather than also highlighting and positive stories. And I always wish that we talk about this in uh, the other nations. But if I were to answer uh, your richest experiences in one particular area, it is because listening to you and hear in the background of your lecture. Pretty much of what is happening in the Central African Republic, and I'm aware of your visit this year. And related to the call for early action, and also uh, referring to your own background as a journalist, how do we in practice deal with situations in which what you are told is that the law is respected? And that jurisprudence is the cause of good governance. And yet, the underlying issues, some of which are related to exclusion and marginalization, are key driving factors. And in order not to wrong, exclusion and marginalization, you know, is key in Central Africa. First challenge is. The refusal to talk about what's considered the regular. And yet we know it is a driving factor. Whether we like it or not, the relationship between Muslims and Christians in Central Africa, the configuration of what that means. Yesterday, when the new parliament session began, the first move by members of parliament in Central Africa is to try to move the Speaker of Parliament, the Kaswa. At the highest level of government, he's the only Muslim. And he has been playing that balancing role in a fairly deeply entrenched and divided society along religious lines. So the argument is that as long as we follow the right procedures, there's nothing happening that's wrong. But you and I know that if you remove the castle, who has been Of marginalization. And so, on one hand, as the law wants to speak to it, nothing is happening that is technically wrong. On the other hand, society is further divided by those who strongly believe that this is another example of how we are marginalized. And I'll start in meetings of 14 hours and I can and hear that echo of marginalization. Your Excellency, this speech like that. How do we respond with an early action when in the indicators no law is broken and yet we know that society is being further marginalized? Whether it is real, 
were it's perception, but some people believe that because of their religious affiliation, they are never considered to belong. And this is another example that you are taking out our representative at the highest level of government, the proof that we don't Thank you very much. We're taking another one and two interventions before we come back. Thank you very much. My name is Ernest Ansabate and uh, I staff here at the KPTC. And thank you very much for the lecture. Very insightful. Mine is three uh, concerns. The first one is this sustainable piece that we are talking about. What exactly is it? Especially for me, in practical terms, translating it uh, on the ground to prevent violence, conflict, and atrocities that development is about. And I like the scenario that you gave that peace and justice are like twins, they split. Now, this scenario that we are looking at, from the west or the hip, you will not find any difference between peace and justice. In fact, they are almost identical. But from the hip, we are looking in the city that in different direction, pursuing different goals. Which of these scenarios should we look at in terms of state? Peace, especially if I'm a practitioner and I want to translate it on the ground. The second has to do with the Gambia. And I like the fact that a lot has been done, especially the international partners, to bring Gambia to the point that we have it now. But almost everybody is going to Gambia. And you have a lot of programs going on in parallel. SSR is going on, transitional justice is going on, reconciliation, rule of law, and human rights reforms. And all these are very important. But where do we prioritize? To the extent that we don't confuse the new, that we don't confuse the new government, which is also starting to find its feet. And I'd like to point out about coordinating our efforts. Have we really seen coordination in Gambia despite all the efforts that we are making? I know that from the perspective uh, that you have given, maybe your priority will be uh, work for law reforms and human rights reforms. Now, the third concern I have is this early action that is spoke of, which is very important. That is not only important to give the other one, but it's equally necessary to take any action. But in situations where the action is being taken and you have the atrocities going on, when does the heavy action start and when does it end? And the PRC, uh, no, the CAR case has been explicitly mentioned. Because the action is being taken, and yet you have some of these breaches going on. So, when do we take the early action in this particular slide? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more introduction before we come back to the panel. All right. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. My name is Craig Daso. I'm a researcher here at the KAIPTC. Uh, thanks so much for your insightful perspectives. Over the years, we have witnessed, you know, the whole concept of sovereignty undergoing 
you know, dependencies they need in other words, sovereignty is undergoing uh, some changes in terms of how it has traditionally been uh, perceived. But then at the same time, in recent time, we'd say a drift, you know, away from world neutralism towards nationalism, protectionism, and the likes. How are we able to ensure uh, the prevention of atrocity private collective prevention of conflict within these contradictory tendencies? Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, regarding the situation in Seattle, um, thank you for informing me about uh, what was happening yesterday. I was in the pit, so I don't know if uh, they managed to uh, remove uh, the Caswa or not. But in any case, the point you made is very clear, and I do share. I spoke about exclusion, I spoke about marginalization. And in the context of CAR, I think. Uh, we have been uh, high, closing our eyes, avoiding to see the reality on the ground. I remember my first visit to Syria. That's when I discovered really the dimension, the religious dimension. It was there. The world is not a religious country. This too was not a religious country, definitely. But at the end of the day, we discovered that there was a religious connotation. When as a Muslim, you name your child after a Christian name, simply to make sure that that child is protected tomorrow. When that child at school is discriminated as well. But the problem is, if you go back to the initial project, the one who took power after the Seleka, and who, in fact, he has a Christian name, and he's a man who supports Seleka. But I think what is needed is to make sure that in South Africa, in power, they manage to die in the most constructive manner. And this is still missing. And I made it very clear, even with President Guadalajara, said, look, can we make sure that we appoint Fulani Muslim in that region? There was not a single Fulani in that area. When I traveled with the Minister of Defense to Brilliant, met with one of the uh, armed groups. General. The minister did acknowledge this too that before their time there was discrimination even within the army. And I can give another an illustration of exclusion to the case in the case of Burundi. Burundi for many decades, the Hutu, the large community in Burundi, were excluded within the army. And I remember at the time even asking the former uh, head of the army in Senegal uh, to uh, act as a consultant on my behalf. That was when I was heading the international community in Geneva. At the time, I think the best way for Burundi is to restructure their army to make sure that Hutu's goals are incorporated. And the then president, Yoya, seemed to be going in that direction. But all the military officers, they, when they conducted their own assessment, they no way if we do it, that would be the end of the, we will lose the power of this government. So the consequence was that we faced terrible war, war. So I do agree we need to be more, I would say, committed on this issue of uh, the, the management of diversity. Yeah. And I hope that they will not uh, replace uh, Mesa with uh, Karim by uh, non-Muslims. 
But I think that balance was something which was we need to really make that community, that massive community, this balance, that they are part of this country. And then uh, regarding the question of um, uh, sustainable peace, I mean, as you may know, for the first time, even the Security Council went to speak about sustaining peace. I mean, it's not so we used to speak about sustainable development. We think it's very familiar that. But sustaining peace, what really does it mean? Peace is not the absence of war. Peace goes beyond that. And in this regard, that's, uh, it is key that we address peace from all parts, holistic view about peace. I was just look, uh, looking at an op-ed that was published by our friend Jeffrey Sachs. It was about billionaires rich for the stars while the world suffered. And I was simply shocked to see that. The world economy is pumping, you say, trillions of dollars into the accounts of a few thousand people. And it would suffice only that one of those people take one small part, it would have cured uh, the disease of African children, for example, in this continent. So, the digital age has created greener take all markets and information including our personal data, the market to the right system. And say that in the past dozen years, according to four magazines, the number of billionaires and their net worth are both roughly tripled from 793 billionaires with $2.6 trillion in net worth in 2006 to around 2,200 billionaires with $9.1 trillion as of March. This is very unbelievable. And at the same time, what I will see, we have seen poverty, extreme poverty. We have seen today, see people dying simply because of the lack of uh, appeal uh, to cure malaria. So we need to really revisit our narrative. And I think that's where the sustainable development goes. And it should not be simply uh, struggling. It has to be translated into action. I think Christine is well placed better than I to elaborate on that, uh, on, on that aspect. But to my view, one other important aspect is the, the justice dimension. And, uh, and this will lead to the question raised by, uh, by Grace. I mean, there can be no peace without justice. But also, you need, I mean, there can be no uh, peace without development. No peace without justice. And at the end of the day, what we are simply uh, saying is that time has come to make sure that all these elements are linked. I mean, when I say the justice, in the case of CAR, we back that question. I have to warn the UN Peace and Security, uh, the AU Peace and Security. So there were arguments by some African leaders that while we should turn the page, we should then amnest the, the policies they to, to all these leaders. I said, no, this country, one of its problems in addition to exclusion and marginalization is impunity. Crimes have been committed in Seattle for many decades and have been. And passion. The only time you have had is some kind of some kind of trial with the trial of Bocas Stranger. But on the other hand, another dimension also is why the Central African people, the, the elite and the family, is not able to pay attention uh, to the situation of their population. Most of them have that one, that one national. They are either friends in German or Paris. And these people, I would say, they don't care much about their people. They care about their sense of interest. And that's why I think this issue needs to be, to be discussed. This 
specificity, and uh, I'm afraid if they don't take action, we will continue to see these armed groups continue to fight. We will see also foreign government, foreign countries, coming also there, siding with one group, being protected by those groups to lose the uh, manual resources, diamond gold, so uh, we cannot complain afterwards. We need to be bold today. I mean, uh, we witnessed uh, recently the killing of three journalists in uh, uh, Russia. Now, uh, Russia is present there. I mean, they even ensure the protection of the victim, something which was done before by the one military. You have France, which is the former colonial ruler in that country. So, so, so at the end of the day, I think the African have to assume their responsibility to really love their country. I mean, uh, until we have the dream of Kwame uh, Nkrumah, the dream of the Maryland called Martin's Guy, becoming a reality, having one night in Africa, I'm afraid we will continue to face also. So that is a political dimension also in the prevention of people. We have been divided. Uh, last words, that's about uh, the Gambia, Salate. I, I think you, you're right, there's a need for uh, better coordination. The speech that uh, Mohammed had just stepped out, I was going to ask him to uh, update us. Because, I mean, personally, I have to say, my heart is. Really, what I can do to support the Gambian government today. I mean, uh, on the 15th of October uh, next week, they are going to inaugurate the uh, uh, reconciliation commission on 15 October Monday. Uh, the SSR is on the ground. But uh, I need to meet everybody I need for a better coordination. I don't know how far they have gone, uh, but we may ask. Uh, Somebody to help us. Early action, I like said, well, in the case of Sierra, you can still have uh, prevention while the conflict is ongoing. Even when conflict is going, you can still conduct preventative action. And that's what we are doing constantly in Sierra today. We are supporting uh, the National Committee for the Prevention of Genocide, that's against humanity. Supporting the human rights division. And as you know, uh, trans action has been recently adopted. Uh, how to prevent the hate speech, uh, and we shows the level that if you have hate speech, you have seen the killing of the Muslim community in the We need to take effort, and those efforts are to take Why? We have sporadic uh, attacks uh, today. Thank you very much. We have time for another round. There's a few other people who'd like to ask a question. Make a short comment. Um, currently, as we speak, um, there's somewhat great conflict in Cameroon, um, where there's been killings of the uh, white speaking side against the French side against. Um, seeming war in life between the separatist group and government forces. This is in advance of an election, like an event election. What kind of action is needed to uh, be taken in Cameroon to ensure that uh, over 400 people are told that? Very so far to ensure that this doesn't escalate the country, what already is not, because one of the competing factors is marginalization um, by the French majority. Well, I, 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 I would say that, uh, I mean, you may have followed me uh, on BBC uh, the last few days on this issue. Uh, to me, it's not very. Really uh, an issue of, uh, I would say, francophone, anglophone. 
because we have within the Anglophone community uh, Cameroon women who are strongly opposed to any idea of a separation, any idea of a cessation. And I do support that uh, group. Because to me, it is simply unacceptable today in this continent that we speak about the right to see. I just said earlier that my dream is to see the dream of public command becoming a reality, that we have the United Africa instead of having 54 states. It doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we, uh, we need to be very integrated. I mean, uh, if we were denied, Africa would become definitely uh, ahead of you know, paradise. But we are still. Not like, and we are subject to any form of control. Why? Why can we do that? And that's why I said I work to make it very clear: no separation. I will say that there is an issue of governance. There was frustration definitely within the Anglophone community because can you believe that we have the Ohad, which is this. Uh, uh, legislation regarding the business law uh, among these uh, the Francophone countries in the region, and let's say the West. That law has never been wasn't, wasn't translated into English for how many years? Of course, those Anglophone business plan were suffering of that. Go to the education system. We find also. Uh, weaknesses in the education system affecting that Anglophone community. In my view, uh, when uh, a year ago these uh, so called uh, Amazonians decided to have their own flag, we saw the acquisitive in committee by the laws of separatists. But unfortunately, we also witnessed the reaction, brutal reaction uh, from the government. Armed forces. And I take on this is that I hope that after these elections of 7th of October, President Diaz, if ever he is elected, and it looks like you go by the polls that he has just been elected, I hope that he will assume that this is going to be his last term. He will be a legacy of unity in that country. As you know, Cameroon, you had at the time those two parts, they decided to unite, and that's why we named the fact that we united at the time of the Republic of Canada. But we need to take action to bring an end to violence. And that is why I say, first and foremost, there is a need to investigate the alleged crimes committed by both parties. Make sure that those identified will be brought to account. But it is also important that strong measures be taken to improve the governance, to make sure that no one will feel being excluded. You can be an Anglophone, you can be a Francophone. Because there are Francophones who are feeling that they are in disadvantage. That brings us to the issue of how can we make sure that the corruption is for hard. At the time, President Lee had to follow the measures fighting corruption, people were arrested, brought for uh, the cause. And this is the other issue. We need in this continent to fight corruption and to be serious about it. I mean, I had a privilege to draft the first, to, to, to the first draft of the African Convention to fight corruption. But when you see today, you still are facing situation in many countries in this continent where corruption, and of course, where you have uh, Corruption, that means in the North also we have people who are facilitating that corruption. Because when those people steal the funds here, you know, they think it in, in, in Western uh, banks uh, or some paradise, but even there, measures are being taken. And that, that's the main difference you have is that tomorrow, if you are found in the United States, that you are involved in a corruption case, you face death. Definitely, but that's not the case in many African countries 
where you are still some leaders uh, who are uh, embracing the public funds. I know we're running down the clock here. Can I put you on the spot, Dr. Chambers, to give a little update to the question on Gambia or any other comments that you'd like to have the mic, please? Thank you very much, and um, we appreciate this uh, very brilliant lecture by my brother and friend, Adama. The one who knows Adama is not uh, a surprise to listen to a, such a very illuminating lecture from me. Um, specifically, uh, on the Gambia, um, this is one case where uh, the UN working with partners trying to advance the Secretary General's initiative on sustaining the peace. And as uh, I don't know, elaborated on, um, oftentimes uh, we all get uh, excited and work around and go to a support a particular country. And, um, we also then very quickly lead it to its own devices. And then the risk of a relapse is very high in that uh, context. Uh, with the Gambia, I should say also uh, with the Burkina Faso, uh, we determined very early that we need to, to stay with the process work mostly with the regional partners in this particular case with the airports and see in which areas we provide very quick and continuing support to stabilize the situation. And, um, the three areas that we have selected, the one, security sector four, to know the nature of the security system that was established in Chad. One that was very skewed in favor of this ethnic group and made it rather balanced and difficult to see how we would uh, provide the necessary security in the post of the Chad area. And now, uh, as I had the question, raise this issue, um, they seem to have been a little bit of a capture. Too many actors coming in at the same time. I mean, on the one hand, it was good that there was such interest in supporting that we have a school But on the other hand, it was overwhelming the system. Um, I'm happy and glad that the last time we were there, Realized that the various experts that have been fielded by different partners, AU, the EU, uh, UK, of course, we were there, we went with the security sector advisor, have now established a coordinated mechanism through which we try to direct support from different partners in the SSR. Properly, in the way that the Gambians uh, get benefit from this kind of synergy. I think there's still work to be done there. Um, when we initially were <coughs> to fill an assessment initially, uh, we tried to ensure that this was done at the same time. You know, I, I tried to ensure that the AU, FORS, and UN, and UN when they together to do the assessment. I believe that if we did that, then we could all understand which particular areas provide support. It was very good with the common data. Right. So there's continuing work to do that. The other area was in justice, truth and reconciliation. Uh, again, as highlighted in the 
lecture where there's no justice. It's difficult to understand. Where there's gross abuse of human rights, denial of people's basic fundamental rights, as well as the case of that man, it's difficult to talk of sustainable means. And we also all know that we have here the judicial system practically collapsed. Justice of the regime. In fact, the Jami wanted was what they did with the Gambia. So, more or less, I have to redo the entire judicial system. And, uh, at the same time, we want to find out what really happened. How did the country be lively and lovely, gentle? People descend into the kind of program which is the Gambian laws. And uh, what do you do to uh, bring out the truth and help the people to reconcile with each other and learn to live with each other? But ensuring that uh, people account. Actions and that there is uh, compensation when necessary, but also uh, uh, ensuring that people face the law when there have been extreme uh, violations of excesses. That process is ongoing, it took some time to, to get started, and it was probably necessary. Because we're hearing around the country, we hear from people what exactly do they expect out of this process of justice, truth, and reconciliation. Um, indeed, the commission will be launched on the 15th of this month. I will be attending with other colleagues the long ceremony. That year is very nice to have uh, found a chair. Very balanced person. I'm uh, not saying that the voice is coming from the UN, but he is many people in this country doing it. Christine was uh, a previous uh, time in your position. Uh, Abla Jane, uh, who has uh, uh, been elected, selected to be the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission in the Gambia as well. We have our support. Successful end. And the final, uh, or the third area which we try to help us in working with the country to come up with a national development plan to quick start development because Gambia is, like many of our countries, a very beautiful uh, country, beautiful population, and per capita, one of the higher countries. High level of illegal migration. In a small country, the numbers of Dublins who are using what they call in Gambia a backdoor, the very high, cross the Sahara, the Mediterranean, and take all kinds of risks to leave, obviously because of the pressure of the region, but also because of lack of government. So uh, we have worked with the Gambia. To Put together a national development plan, which again was very well responded to when we had the bill around the table in Brussels. We were able to raise the 1.7, 1.8 billion dollars that they asked for. And we are working with all those who pledged the money to deliver. I have to say that sometimes it's a point. Go to the round table. Also, very that is I made that the follow up is not always as promising as the thing. So, we need to support the Gambia to kickstart the economy, to be able to create jobs for the teaming youth who supported the uh, birth of the new Gambia and who should not be disappointed in the aspiration because if uh, 
they don't see the dividends of democracy, then I'm betrayed them. And I have this tendency and this appointment set them very good. So these are some of the areas that we will be working in. And uh, in this time, providing technical support to the Gambia, but also trying to ensure that all the partners are working together. Airport, the EU, the EU, the EU, uh, and many bilaterals who continue to show a lot of interest in the Gambia and our support process. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been very rich. So thank you very much for the most interesting Peace. 
it is, it is not to me that the, what's not at all is not how much we can save in terms of money when we work effectively on prevention. Because that, that, that is not, that cannot be the other It's not about money, it's about people, it's about culture values, it's about completely different things. But it is the whole issue around inclusion. Are we understanding inclusion? Are we manifesting? So that's the only reflection I'd like to add. Thank you very much for thoughtful questions and especially you for the chance for willing to shout out and speak so frankly and also congratulate you on your extremely important contributions, recognizing acting, because that's what it takes. It takes that political will, systematic action to actually prevent something. The Gandhi is an excellent case. We need to learn a lot more, not as some wonder and said that they will have a young one of us. Just to say thank you very much to Steve for your know, very able sharing of this uh, session and thank you once again to the director of Dr. Marshall for offering me this uh, privilege to really uh, participate uh, in this uh, session. Thank you for the first ever combined both the two new great statements of Kokana and Kata Marshall. Uh, I should say that about Kata Marshall, uh, when he began a lesson with the, uh, the Secretary General, there was an event at the Scandinavian House. And following that event, I said to Eliasson, that this is simply unacceptable. Uh, having this uh, ceremony only for these limited people. I want this to take place at the United Nations. And uh, I promoted that event, and we had the uh, concert in the uh, Trusteeship Council. Why? Because I, I think uh, that I'm not sure for the young people of my generation, I look about, I uh, think, and about 30 years when he was assassinated, and I put it code and code for go, um, that had been associated with the uh, establishment of the commission led by my younger brother and tried to call the justice of Tanzania. Uh, and I hope that one day uh, we will definitely have the, uh, the evidence. And just watching recently, this uh, last movie, which by the place on the sleeve of the one can see that the RC, you know, started to become a problem from day one. And sometimes I say that Amashwa certainly uh, was killed because he wanted something different. Umba was killed. Why these two people were killed? And that's he paying the price of uh, that situation. Now, friends, let's remember only one thing. The price of freedom is certain vigilance. That is one wise man to say that. And that is something I witnessed in my life as a chicken of ICT, as a major stock in ICTR. I was the last person to met in prison at Vietnam two days before the genocide started in uh, Rwanda. I visited recently Bosnia, Western Balkan. Why? Because I was extremely worried to see convicted war criminals being, uh, their names being named dormitories of students. I was worried to see the genocide of Srebrenica being denied, and denied. But I said to the European Commission, be vigilant. Because what is happening is simply unacceptable. How can you try to not try to ICT one convicted these people and these people now are being led as heroes? So we have to be vigilant. We have to be to an end that type of behavior. We have to make sure that. The deficit of reconciliation in Bosnia and in the Western Balkan at large is reduced. So 
so that they can follow the real history. Now, we are looking at the belief that in the mid 90s, the world we witnessed the knowledge of science in the heart of the young. No one would have even believed that there would be a world in the young. But it happened. It happened. So, no religion, no country is immune from adversity crisis. Therefore, we have to invest on the invention. Pay attention to the invention of the attention to the way our model that is why it will be a decided to face prevention at the highest of its action. And that is why it is known to even decided also to reform uh, even the asking system to make sure that the resident coordinators not only be uh, empowered reporting directly, but actually fully their responsibility. Rather than the only deal with development, because at the end of the day, development deals also for the prevention. I thank you. So, thank you very much for just a few short comments and to pick up on what you just said. I mean, Secretary General Guterres was here at the state team of Copium a couple weeks ago. He took the opportunity to meet with the UN colleagues, about 300 colleagues in a town hall. And he took that opportunity to tell us about really his motivation for the reforms he's trying to lead that link together the humanitarian, the peace building, peacekeeping, and the development work of the United Nations on the basis of respect for human rights. And I think we've been reminded here this morning about how important those connections are, that we can't have justice with peace, without the development, without the inclusive, sustainable development, that the UN really needs to link all of these together um, in both preventive and response situations. And I was also reminded of something that was said, I think, at one of the board meetings here. I think it was said by the Minister of Defense and Government in response to the usual um, update about this Get it, though, he said he thought the biggest risk to security and peace in West Africa was youth unemployment. And I think that really also reinforces what we're talking about today of, of exclusion, marginalization, dashed expectations, creating an environment that is exactly the opposite of peace and justice, and that there is nothing to take for granted in that. But I wanted to end with. What I think is a pertinent quote from the man we're commemorating this morning, the late UN Secretary General Doc Commercial, something from his book, Marking, which has been a long term favorite of mine, although I think I was a little bit more idealistic when I read it than you, and perhaps no further wise when I read it in late middle age. But one quote I think I want to share with you he said, When I think of those who will come after or survive me, I feel as if I were taking part in the preparations for a feast, the joys of which I shall not share. I think you are part of taking up the mantle. Thank you. And the work that you are doing is very important. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and inspiration from our lecture today, and I hope that that will take us forward in our own commitments. So thank you very much. I carry it over to you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for sharing the lecture. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will wrap up in here in less than 10 minutes. Uh, at this point, KFTC wants to present some gifts to the guest speaker. KFTC and the Commercial Foundation wants to present gifts to the guest speaker and our chairperson. So I'd like to call on our commandant to present a gift to Mr. Adana Dina to give the Foundation also is ready to do that.
Mind is a very simple, simple, simple gift. It's actually a motion that uh, our company has. Perhaps it's worth some inspiration for the work. So on behalf of the Commandant and Staff of Care I would like to thank you all for participating in this event, particularly to our distinguished guests on the high table, Her Excellency Evans Clark and Mr. Damaki for putting this event on your busy schedule, submitting time to be part of it. Thank you so, so much. To the Diagramma Foundation, led by Mr. Henry, I'm agreeing thank you so much to you and your team. Um, for putting this for putting this event together, even though we went very shortly most of the time. Um, we're also very grateful to you, special guests, uh, everyone who we invited here to be part of this event, uh, friends from the media for prioritizing this event on your tight schedules. Just a couple of announcements before we, we leave the auditorium. We are still open the book of condolence. In Arnold's Excellency for Piana in front of the auditorium. So, for those of you who still want to, who might want to sign and share a few thoughts, please, you're welcome to do that. The uh, members of the high table will take a group photograph at the four parts of the center with the living trees who attended the event today. So, right from here, we will do, take the group photograph. Also, members of the media, as we know, that we have set up a tent. Uh, which is on your immediate right when you exit the auditorium. So kindly assemble there for uh, interviews. We've also provided snacks outside, so please help yourselves. Um, the next activity is the round table meeting, and this is very strictly by invitation. So participants for the round table at the multimedia facility. Thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen. May we now rise as members of the high table of Texas. Thank you very much.
Yeah, so that's 10. Yeah, 10 and a half. Thank you. 